Philippians chapter 2, we're particularly going to look at verse 4 to verse 11. And I want to speak to you once again about incarnation, the incarnation of the Son of God. This morning, I want to speak to you about incarnation and humility. Incarnation and humility. Are you ready for Christmas? I lost count of the number of times I've been asked that in the last few days. We say it. Are you ready for Christmas? Uh, And by that, we mean, have you got the presents? Have you got the turkey? Have you done everything? Do you feel you're, you're ready? Now, for someone who's a true Christian, the question is not just, are you ready for Christmas? It, it's the events that happened that we remember at Christmas actually make us ready for the rest of life. It, what happens then, the incarnation of the Son of God, makes us ready to die and ready to live. Now, there's no kind of cast iron rule saying that we have to remember the birth of Christ on the 25th of December. That's a church tradition. It's a helpful thing. But Jesus probably wasn't born on that exact date. But it it is helpful to have a time where we focus on the incarnation and what it means. And, And what I've tried to do in Bible studies and when I've preached in the last couple of weeks is to take some texts from the letters of Paul where Paul the Apostle looks back at those events and we've seen that when Paul talks about the incarnation about the Son of God uh, taking on human flesh that it's always got great relevance to how we live the Christian life we've seen that the incarnation has massive implications for Christian freedom. We've seen that it has massive implications for Christian generosity. We've seen that the incarnation has huge implications for seeing ourselves as the children of God. And what the incarnation of Jesus does is it shines a light and gives us a new way of living in the world. A new way of seeing ourselves and other people. And particularly this passage, what what this passage is saying to us, is saying to us there is a different way of being in the world than just smash and grab and insisting on your own rights. What the incarnation does is it shows us this completely different way. It shows us the Christian grace of humility. Now, Philippians chapter 2, if you've been Christian any amount of time, I trust you know this passage well. Really, this is the mothership of Paul's references to the incarnation. Paul takes us the story behind the story, the, the shepherds and the angels and the wise men. Paul doesn't focus on any of that. Instead, he tells the big story of Jesus being fully and completely God and humbling himself and being born as a man and humbling himself even to death on the cross. This is a a huge, big story of the incarnation. It's a colossal story. It's the great story of history. But Paul is, is telling it to us because he wants all of us to take on board this new way of regarding people with humility. Look at verse 4. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. There's this different way of living. There's this different way of seeing other people. Not just holding on to your own things, but looking out to other people and seeing what is best of them. When I grew up in a Church of England primary school, we had a vicar who told the same story over and over again. So I remembered it. And it's kind of got a bit of wisdom in it. It it comes in the form of a a Chinese proverb. Apparently, and it's probably a made up story, but I like it. There was this old Chinese wise man who died and the angel came uh, to take him and said, right, I'm taking you to heaven. And uh, the, uh, the, 
the wise man said, I tell you what, I'd just like to go and see the other place. I'd like to go and see what hell is like. <coughs> so in the, in the story, and it's a made up story, it's not a Bible story, but it's got an element of truth in it. He gets taken to hell. What is hell like? Well, in this room, there was a, a large, large table with a great banquet on. And uh, uh, there was spread out in this banquet all kinds of amazing foods, sumptuous, wonderful food. And there were loads of people sat round the table, but they all looked glum and really, really sad. And the reason they all looked sad is because they had massive chopsticks attached to their arms. I told you this was a silly story, a made-up story. They had massive chopsticks attached to their arms. And the problem was is that they couldn't reach the food and bring it to their mouths. And so, for all eternity, they had nothing to eat. They were in constant sadness because they couldn't, they couldn't bring the food closer. And uh, after a bit, the wise man said, this place is terrible. It's awful. And then uh, she said, oh, well, take me to heaven. And so he went to heaven. And there, in the story, this made-up story, uh, with a grain of truth, um, was the same room with the same banquet and, uh, uh, and with lovely, wonderful, sumptuous food and loads of people around the banquet and uh, they were all smiling, they were all happy, they were all satisfied and they all had long chopsticks on their arms um, and he thought, why is everybody happy in here? And he watched them eating and they were feeding each other so constantly they were happy. And obviously that's a silly story, but it's got a grain of truth in it, hasn't it? And the grain of truth is, humility, preferring other people's needs, is at the heart of heaven. It is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. When you're with really humble people, there is a peace and a serving of each other. This is the distinctive Christian attributes it's the thing that that Jesus has taught the world humility I mean even non-Christians in the last 100 200 years you look at it like the kind of ideal person or the ideal statesman traditionally we've said yeah they've got to be really clever and stuff but we want somebody with magnanimity we want a kind of humble person we want a person who thinks of others actually in our culture we're at a period of change where we're saying, no, actually, we want ambitious people and self-motivated people and people who look out for themselves. But traditionally, we've looked for people who are, are humble. And where has that come from? That's come from Christianity. This is the great Christian ethic, is humility. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, re- think of others better than yourselves. What is Christian humility? What is it? Now, this is where uh, you've heard this passage before, but we have to do some fancy footwork here because we need to think about it. What is it to prefer other people's needs before yourself? This gives us a new way of looking at power, a new way of regarding other people. Christian humility is not simply being a doormat. It's not simply saying, oh, I'll just be weak. There you go, have your say, and I'll just be small and empty and bigger people, you have your way. Christian humility is not simply being weak. There is weakness, there is service, but it's not simply being weak. That's not the Christian approach to power. Nor is the Christian approach to power being strong. I'll I'll have all my own way. I'll get my own way. Oh, I got that person to do this. I'll insist on this. It's not being a doormat. It's not being a tyrant. What is it? What is it? Christian humility is where we use our power. We use the position that we have. So there's nothing wrong with Christians having positions of power and influence and authority. But we use that for the good of others. Christian humility is a movement towards other people. It's not simply just throwing in the towel and saying, oh, have your way. I'll just be quiet and small in the corner here. 
It's not going, right, I'm going to get you. You have to do what I do. I'll use words. I'll insist on my own way. I'll use my power to get what I want. It's thinking. It's taking our chopsticks. And it's instead of trying to feed ourselves, it's saying, what's best for that person? How can I help them? It's a movement away from myself towards somebody else. And it is absolutely revolutionary. And I'm not sure, looking at this verse this morning and this week, that I've entirely got this as a Christian. I would quite like to be a doormat and just let other people carry on and be small and weak. Sometimes I'm like, right, I'm going to be boss. But to absolutely think what is best for someone else, that is something that doesn't come to us as sinners. That is something that the gospel teaches us. And Paul is writing to this church in Philippi. They're knowing divisions. They're knowing arguments. Paul is saying, look, you've got to be united in the gospel. And and the only way they're going to do that is that if they have this grace of humility, if they move towards each other, each of you should look not only to your own interests, but the interests of others. There was a a great Christian leader called John Stott. John Stott, uh, Anglican evangelical, preached the gospel all over the world, was very, very famous in his day. Towards the end of his life, a pastor took his uh, 14-year-old son to hear him speak. And this 14-year-old boy had hold, heard about John Stott, never seen a picture of him, but read his books and stuff, had held him in awe. And he thought, oh, I'm going to hear a lecture by this great theologian called John Stott. And they got to this conference place, they were having coffee, and he was waiting for John Stott to come. And this old bloke started talking to him and asking him about what he was doing for his GCSEs and uh, what he wanted to do for a job and what, he, what things he, he, he did for his hobbies. And he talked to this lovely old bloke and he thought, what a nice chap. And then he sat and waited for John Stott to get up and give his talk. And it was the old bloke. And he thought, and the, uh, the pastor's son grew up and uh, he's in Christian ministry. And he said, I've read everything that John Stott has written, but nothing has made more of an impression than me than that moment. Because when you meet a really humble person, you don't go, oh, they were really humble. You say, weren't they interested in me? Didn't they think of me? The fact that he was interested with all that, there's this movement away towards... And what I'm saying is, and the reason I'm stringing this out and talking about it so much, is that we need to get it. In Philippians 5, uh, Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11, Paul is saying the ultimate example of that is Jesus Christ himself. You need to move towards each other in humility. You need to do this because this is what Christ has done. This is what Jesus has done. This is the story of of the incarnation. Now, obviously, our humility and Jesus' humility are, are slightly different. We're sinners. We've got a lot to be humble about. We make all kinds of mistakes. Jesus Christ never sinned at all. There is a difference between our humility and his humility. And yet his humility as the Son of God gives us a totally different way of thinking and seeing the world. Verse 5 says, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Literally, have this mind that is yours in Christ Jesus. Has this way of thinking. When you think of other people, when you think of other Christians, the gospel has given you a, a different way of thinking about them. Think about them like this. Look at Jesus's humility. Let's work our way through. Verses 6 to verse 11. Let's follow these verses. What is the story behind Christmas, behind the incarnation? What is this story of humility? Well, look, before Jesus Christ was born, he existed as the Son of God, and he was in the highest position of authority and power. He was in the very nature of, God. 
He was God, the Son of God, equal with the Father and Spirit. Clearly says it there. He was equal with God in every way. Worshipped, adored, full of power, full of glory, full of holiness. He was fully and completely God, adored by angels. He had the highest position of power that you can imagine. And it was his by rights. So before the baby was born in the manger, he was at the highest position of power. Sometimes at Christmas, they tell you about what the royals are up to. One Christmas Eve, a few years ago, uh, there was a headline that Prince William, who does um, stuff with uh, homeless, he is the head of a homeless charity. One Christmas Eve, Prince William left his palace, Kensington Palace, got a sleeping bag and a woolly hat and slept rough on the streets of London. He left the palace. He left his glory, the things that he was entitled to. And for one night only, roughed it on the streets of London. I assume he did that with about 16 bodyguards <laughs> and maybe, <laughs> maybe a thermos flask of hot, of hot cocoa. I don't know. But here, here, we, we love those kinds of stories of somebody giving up glory. But this is the ultimate riches to rags tale because Jesus Christ was in the very nature God's. And this blows my mind about verse 6 because it gives you, you know, like um, at the moment, people love kind of behind the scenes documentaries that give you the behind the scenes documentary about Ronnie O'Sullivan or the behind the scenes documentary about uh, Colleen Rooney. What was going through her mind when she went through the the Wagga for Christie trial? We want to know what they were thinking of. Verse 6 gives you the behind the scenes of the um, of the incarnation what was in the son of God's mind when he received the command from the father to humble himself and for the salvation of lost and guilty sinners to go to the cross how did he regard his riches of glory how did he think about it he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped That just blows me away. He didn't regard his high position as something to be held on to at all regards. Very often, if I get something that belongs to me, that's mine, I want to keep it. I want to hold on to it. It's not very often we hear of the CEO of a a, a posh company uh, giving up all their uh, salary and all their riches to become a cleaner. We don't hear about that kind of thing very often. But here we have the Son of God willing to give up his rights to be worshipped and adored for the good of others. And that tells you something about God, the, the God that the Bible reveals, the God that Jesus Christ reveals to us. What is God like? He's powerful, he's holy, he's awesome. And yet also, he wills to help other people. He goes out towards other people. There's this goodness and and love. I mean, it's incredible. Who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. So what did he do? Well, in the plan of salvation... When it came for the time for the Messiah to be born, the Son of God did something incredible. He made himself nothing, the verse says, taking the very nature of a servant. Have you ever heard the phrase, oh, he's poured himself into that business. He's poured himself into that uh, piece of art he's done. Oh, she really put everything into that family. She's given her life and soul. She's poured into it. Now, think about this. The Son of God, without stopping being God, 
He made himself nothing, not that he stopped being God or left any of his attributes behind or anything like that, but by being born in human nature, in the appearance of a man, real and true humanity, he poured himself completely into serving us and helping us. He humbled himself, taking the very nature of a servant. Without stopping being God, he became what he wasn't before. So the one who was all-powerful was held in the arms of a mother. The one who made the stars, the stars shone on him where he was. The one who could command legions of angels grew up in Nazareth unnoticed. He humbled himself and became a servant. That's the whole of his life, was serving. So he noticed others in his ministry. He walked towards the sick and the suffering and and the sorrowful. He was rejected. He was a servant. And, And that serving didn't just stop at his birth, at his incarnation. It continued throughout his life. Look at verse 8. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. He obeyed God's law. He entered a broken world. He loved God. He perfectly obeyed him and went through all the pain of this life. So Jesus' life, if you like, is, is this straight line going from glory all the way down. This amazing step of incarnation being born in human uh, likeness with all the shame and the rejection of the stable and the flight to Egypt and all of that. And yet didn't stop there. Down, down, down. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. The most shameful, forsaken, horrid death. More than that, a death where he is abandoned, it seems, even by his father. A cursed death. A death where he has taken sin upon himself. A death in our place. Even the death on a cross. And in the darkness he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Doesn't insist on his own rights. He could in the Garden of Gethsemane call out a legion of angels to defend him. But he doesn't. He gives, he pours it all out. It's this incredible story of humility and so there's this straight line isn't there from glory to the cross via (laughs) via the stable and the manger down 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 till Christ dies in our place and even then Christ doesn't exalt himself look at verse 9 it's the father who exalts him Therefore God has exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, the resurrection and the ascension. Jesus ascends to the highest place in the universe. And Jesus is on the throne as king right now. And this is the Christian um, confession to the world. A Christian is, is someone who can truly say Jesus is Lord. The crucified one who died for sin is risen from the dead, and he is Lord. He's numero uno. He's number one. He's my boss, my captain, my saviour. He rules. That's what a Christian can say and must say. And, uh, And yet, one day, it says here, every knee in heaven and earth and under the earth will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody will be saved. You can acknowledge that such and such is uh, head of the country and you can still say, not my king, I don't want that. And loads of people in the world right now don't acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. They don't want anything to do with him. One day they will acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord when he comes again. The one who suffered on the cross will be revealed in glory and everyone will say Jesus is Lord. But at that point, it won't do them any good. It will be reluctant and they will be forced to face life, eternal life, away from his goodness in the punishment of hell. A 
Christian is somebody who can say now that Jesus is Lord, who acknowledges now that Christ is Lord. So do you see, Christ has not exalted himself. There's this great humility, this astonishing humility, leaving the riches of glory, born in human likeness, humbled to death on a cross, yet exalted to the highest place. What has that got to do with you and me? What I'm saying, that if you've heard this story again and again, I was just thinking this morning, this is astonishing. I wish I got my head around this because this gives me a new way of being towards people and being towards other Christians. That it's not being a doormat, just being weak. It's not, oh, I've got to try and get everybody to march to my tune. And relationships become kind of this, this aren't human relationships complex? Aren't relationships between Christians complex? The incarnation shows us a way through. That I move towards people. I use power and authority, whatever I have, for the good of someone else. I truly look to them. I'm truly interested in them. I think about them. I move towards them. And uh, I do that for the good of others. Uh, And that teaches me uh, a different way of being. Christ is my saviour. Praise God. And he's my example. He shows me a different way of being in the world. And if only I could learn this truly. If only I stopped insisting on my rights and I looked away from myself and looked to others. And there's a happiness in that. Now, this is not self-denial for the sake of self-denial. It's not just doing hard things or, oh, look, I did a hard thing. It's being truly interested in others and finding your life that way. So just a few things. First thing, this is amazing, that God the Son should humble himself in this way. There is truly nothing like that. I think that's why Paul writes this. You can see in verse 6 to 11, it's put in kind of verse form. There's people who think that this is an early Christian hymn. I don't know if it's an early Christian hymn. Paul probably wrote it. Uh, It's in verses because this is something that's worth praising God for. This is truly astounding. There is nothing like the humility of the Son of God, what God has done in um, sending his Son. Can you say there's nothing like this? Does Jesus have your heart? Do you worship him for this? Second thing, Jesus is showing a new way of being in the world. Are you following his steps? Are you going this way towards serving others? I love being with humble people. And I'd love to be a humble person. I I really would. Because the more humble you are, the more you forget all your gripes and all your groans, the more you can concentrate on the here and now and be thankful for what you have and actually find a joy in in helping people. Um, I think all of us can say this Christmas, Lord, teach me again. Teach me again what it means to humble myself. Another thing, Jesus is Lord. He's the Lord of all. We need to tell people that he's Lord. He deserves the worship of everybody for what he has done. And I I think this verse as well, these verses have, have got to encouragement. Remember that Jesus did not exalt himself. If I really lived like this, putting others' needs before my own, there's a tempt- but what if I don't fight my corner? What if I miss out on something? What if such, and such a thing doesn't change? What, what if, what if? I, I think Paul is telling the Philippians here, look, if you follow the same path of Christ, if you humble yourself, look, the Lord exalted him. Suffering and service, followed by glory. Jesus raised from the dead. So as you follow Christ, 
there is nothing that we miss out. There is nothing that we ultimately give up that we don't, we don't, that we miss out on. There is glory to come. Glory to come. I've spoken long enough. There was a guy and he was taken, a Christian man. He was taking his daughter to school at Easter. And uh, she was taking part in the Christmas school Easter play. And she was playing the part of Jesus. And he was given her a lift. And there was a lady from their church who was also given a lift, lift to. And he dropped her off outside the school. And the lady from the church, as his daughter went, around, uh, went towards the school door to go in, she wound down the window and said, Be a good Jesus today. Now that's not quite theologically right. But, but, we are called incredibly to imitate Christ in a normal day to be like him. Because he's been our saviour, we're to imitate his steps. Your attitude should be the same as that as Christ Jesus. Shall we sing about this together? And any questions you have, please come and see me afterwards.